Tower, this is Flight Juliet Sierra Victor 029 Two minutes into our Europe flight, we have a bored child. Repeat, a bored child. Copy that. Are they stamping their tiny little feet? Affirmative, there is feet stamping. And growling. <laughs> growling. Right, I'm um, consulting the manual. Stand by. Kids will be kids, but they'll be better kids on board Emirates with over 150 kids' channels to entertain them all flight long. Search Emirates Department of Family Travel, your first stop for flying family. Hello and welcome to the Art of Decluttering podcast. I'm Amy Ravel. And I'm Kirsty Perugia. And we are so excited to be with you today because we have a special guest and we're going to be covering a topic that we've not covered before. No, and there's a whole lot that we haven't covered before that may be covered today. We have the amazing Nicole Belsma. Yes, I got it right. <laughs> Nicole um, is just, we met her yesterday, so um, but we were blown away by her. So we, we asked her to come on the podcast and she so graciously said yes. So let me tell you a little bit about her. She is the founder and principal of... A-C-E-S, or do you say ASIS? Australian College of Environmental Studies. Yeah, good, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Um, She's a former naturopath and acupuncturist, um, and actually I'm going to hand over to her to say more about... Can you introduce yourself, Nicole? Sure. (laughs) I worked as a naturopath and acupuncturist for 15 years and started noticing really strong correlations between my patients' health and their homes, but it wasn't until my husband and I moved into our lovely home in Warrandyte and experienced sleep problems um, from the time we moved in and then had 10 miscarriages and no one was able to assist us. Um, recurrent miscarriage clinic we went to, we didn't qualify for IVF because I got pregnant easily. And so I, I began to unpack what had happened from the time we moved into this lovely home on half an acre along the river and realised that we're sleeping near the metre panel got traffic-related air pollutants from the nearby intersection coming into the house and taking hours to dissipate, um, and exposure to noxious gases, geopathic stress under the bed. And over time I said to my husband, look, I think the house is a problem, we need to move to the back bedroom. And we did and had um, the twins, you know, naturally. So at the same time I started to see very strong correlations with my patients with chronic fatigue syndrome and mould, and by the second and third consultation they would often say, what do you think of the visible mould in the room? You know, it's interesting that my symptoms began when I moved into this house and, and you know, I did a double degree, eight years at uni, went to China and did further training at TCM Gongjiao Hospital and we didn't learn anything about how the environment could impact human health. So as I started to look at the research and in particular the vast amount of information from the US EPA site on indoor air quality, I started to look at electromagnetic fields and there was a handful of studies on AC magnetic field exposures and miscarriages like in my case and I realised that we spend 90% of our time inside the house. This is the first place naturopaths should be trained as to how it could affect human health. So the last two decades, um, I set up the Australian College of Environmental Studies. It's now nationally accredited and we run an advanced diploma of building biology, the only um, course of its kind in Australia. And we train them in mould testing, electromagnetic field testing, indoor air quality. We work with trades, how to wire buildings in a way to reduce people's exposure to magnetic fields. We talk to plumbers as to how they should um, fix drainage issues and all these things. So what amazes me about the work we do is we're primarily women, 80% of building biologists are women, but it's a systemic problems across multiple industries that are causing these very sick homes. And I would argue more than 50% of the housing stock in Australia has elephants or or problems that are creating health issues, Mm. especially asthma allergies, chronic fatigue syndrome, it's really clear that the the house is contributing and mould is probably one of the biggest hazards. And we just found it so interesting. We could have just listened to you for hours yesterday at the conference we were at because we are in homes, our homes, but we see a large variety of homes around Australia and we are in the nooks and crannies of homes. So when you go visit a girlfriend, you might sit at the kitchen table and maybe pop into the bathroom, but you're not in her cupboard or under the house or in the laundry cupboards, but we are. And so we're like, oh, my goodness, our clients need to hear some of this. So we thought it would be great to explore some of the things around mould and maybe debunk some ideas that people might have, but also, like, get some education. So I guess the first question is, Nicole, what is mould? 
Yes, good question. Well, mold isn't the problem here. Mold is a type of fungi, and fungi is found from the Arctic to the Antarctica. So it's meant to be uh, across the entire planet, and it is. It's on every surface of every part of your home, and it is not a problem. When you give it food and moisture, that's when it becomes a problem because once it starts growing or sporulating, it produces high fin spores that in high levels, when they're inhaled or breathed in, can cause serious adverse health effects. And now that we've mapped the human genome, we know one in four people can't create antibodies to mould. So instead of developing respiratory tract infections and colds and flus and asthma, which is typical from high levels of mould inhalation, they develop the chronic fatigue-like symptoms. So... Um, I, we refer to it as a water damage building. So when moisture sits on a surface for 48 hours or more, it enables the microbes on that surface to start proliferating. And what their function is, is to produce chemicals to kill each other off to take over that space because it wants to decay your home. Wow. So the key is understanding, <laughs> not giving it the environment it wants. Now, because everything in your house is food, um, the key always with um, water damaged buildings is moisture. Right. So if that's high humidity because you live in uh, humid climates, then you have sustained humidity above 70% for more than two days, all the microbes in, on every mm. surface are going to take off. So that's why the air conditioner needs to be on permanently because it, it's a dehumidifier and pulls moisture out of the air to dry the air. Because my sister lives in far north Queensland and they are const- everything's constantly wet and they find they have to replace like their cushions, their bedding, their pillows like monthly. It's, it's, just, like, it's incredible. Their pillows go mouldy. Exactly. And sometimes overnight, it seems. <laughs> well, that's why they need permanent dehumidification. The only way to address that is to have a permanent dehumidifier on. Now, the refrigerated air conditioner acts as a dehumidifier. It cools by pulling moisture out of the air. But once you turn that off because you've gone on holidays or gone away for the weekend, your house becomes a mould box if you live in a high humid area. Sydney Central Coast is considered to be in the mould belt. And the reason is because it's high sustained humidity, even in colder months like winter. But because it's cooler, you can't justify having the air conditioning on like you would in Cairns or far north Queensland where they have the air conditioning on. They only have two seasons Mm. a year. So that's why they need permanent dehumidifiers in every part of the house to pull that moisture out. If they did that, they wouldn't have those microbial issues. So fascinating. I think, oh, my goodness. (laughs) So is all mould bad? Well, you yeah. kind of already answered that. But, but the, can all mould become bad? The key there is it's there's no specific fungi generally that you'd say that's um, worse than others. What you find in a water damaged building when moisture sits on a surface or it's sustained in the environment, such as in high humid environments, is that you have certain types of fungi that prefer that. And they, we call them um, water damage building. You have certain fungi like Aspergillus, Penicillium, Ketomium, Cladosporium. They typically found... Cladosporium. Cladosporium. Oh, I thought it was Cladosporium. No. I was like, that's the best name ever. <laughs> Cladosporium. <laughs> I think you've just developed a new fungi. <laughs> this is the Amy fungi. <laughs> <laughs> like the split system in this recording studio, I'd want to swab it for... Um, fungi and cladosporum comes up highest in split systems so there's certain types a handful of fungi that you find in all your water damage homes and the problem with those types of fungi is they produce high levels of mycotoxins which when you inhale them they actually affect the central nervous system and they can cause not only lung related problems but in one in four people who can't create antibodies to mold it sets up inflammation in the brain and the problem is when these people go into their homes that are water damaged the brain the immune system goes oh i've never seen your these antigens before i've never seen these fungi before because they can't create antibodies mm. so the inflammation is persistent and what happens is it suppresses key neurotransmitters in the brain that govern infection so so these people have infections all over their body, what we call Marcon's or Staphylococcus infections in the upper respiratory passages and the sinuses. They have infections in the vaginal flora, in their gut. They become gluten intolerant, but they weren't born with celiac. So they develop these symptoms. It starts with um, fatigue, feeling tired when you wake up, and then eventually the sleep becomes disturbed. They can't sleep at night, so they start sleeping during the day because their circadian rhythm is completely stuffed. 
They then started getting fibromyalgia because the inflammation's affecting the um, circulation to the little capillaries in the feet and the, and the fingers so they can get like rain outs phenomena and cold. Their thyroid starts getting impacted because of the inflammation. They then ended up with, can end up with things like anxiety and depression because when you have a inflammation in the brain and it suppresses the neurotransmitters, it means your body can't keep infections at bay. So when you see the naturopath, they're going, oh, you've got candida. And the doctor says you have infection and they end up on one antibiotic after the other which stuffs their whole gut microbiome, unfortunately. Mm. So because the metabolites created from the inflammation create so many byproducts, they block all the liver detoxification pathways, especially one specific one, sulfation. And that's what all your environmental chemicals use. So now they're chemically sensitive. Now they can't use their perfume anymore because it's when they inhale those chemicals from the perfume or from their cleaning products or from the newspaper ink, it's sitting in their blood and just getting recycled because there's no car, spa, car parking spaces mm. through the liver. So it, then it's affecting their uh, all the cells within their body and especially their central nervous system. So now they're getting headaches every time they smell a chemical. Mm. So you've gone from... Um not knowing that there's anything wrong and you've inhaled mold or you, is it always inhale like if you eyes does it ever come in through like a cut or is it no. eyes okay eyes, eyes. And... yep eyes and nose absolutely yeah okay. yep. the way you, you bring... start getting the symptoms absolutely and it mm. happens insidiously over time mm. so that's why cause and effect has often been missed by most naturopaths or clinicians or doctors because they a they're not trained in this I was never trained in this And they don't see, they don't ask the right questions, which is how long have you been sick? When did your symptoms first start? What was going on at that time? Did you move house? Was there a water event that happened at that time? Did you renovate at that time? And of course, the builder has no idea. So they come in, renovate your bathroom, open up an entire wall of hidden mold behind the wall. And now they've spread fungal particulate through the whole house because they didn't contain it and they didn't double bag those uh, water damaged materials. And now it's spread. And that's the key when they got quite sick. Mm. I was going to ask another question, Kev, but you better go because otherwise I'm just going to like pound you with questions. I know, and then it will be the Amy and Nicole show. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Wow. So that is a whole lot of things that can happen because of mould. So how do we know that there's mould in our house? How do we recognise that? What's that look like? Um, And... Is there anything that we can do? <laughs> yes, good questions. Uh, the first, the, the two most important markers for mould in the house is visible mould. By the time you see it, there are millions of spores and hyphae per square inch on that, that surface. So if you see visible mould, if you see a little bit in the grout in the shower, it's unlikely to be an issue because that's typical because the moisture is sitting there on the surface. Um... But when you're seeing it on, say, gyp rock, a wall, dry wall, let's say, in the States, or plasterboard, etc., and um, it's, you know, getting onto the size of a piece of paper, that's a problem because you don't know if the titanic iceberg is behind the wall. That could be a hell of a lot bigger than what you're seeing. So visible mould is the first one. The second one is odour, damp, musty odour. If you smell any odour that could be attributed to microbial growth, that's a problem because it means A, that it's growing and B, it's releasing really toxic chemicals that you're smelling. And the chemicals are there to kill each other off, to take over the space. But when you breathe them in, they're called microbial VOCs. My professor, my supervisor, because I'm doing my PhD on all of this, calls them fungi farts. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. That is very PhD worthy. <laughs> <laughs> very technical. I prefer that myself. <laughs> yeah, you should be dropping that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And it produces my, mycotoxins and the bacteria. Don't forget, it's not just fungi. We actually don't know what it is in a water damage building that causes health effects because when it's long-standing water, you've got bacteria producing very toxic endotoxins, fungi producing mycotoxins, and all of them are producing what we call microbial VOCs or chemicals at room temperature. And they are very bad for our bodies, so you don't want to be in that environment. So the two ones are visible mould and odour are the two most important markers for health problems. What does it smell like? Is it is it the grandma musty smell? 
Or is it like mothball smell no, or is not- it something completely different? Mm, mothball smell is naphthalene, which is carcinogen. We're not going to go there. Horrible. <laughs> it's a damp, musty, earthy odour. Like have you ever been in the subfloor? Yes. I spend a lot of time in the subfloor. Yep. Like today. Before it's, it... That's really an earthy smell. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a damp, earthy damp, smell. Damp, earthy yeah. smell. Um, different people describe it differently and depending on you, our sensitivity to odours varies enormously. Mm. You know, so the ones who are more sensitive to it tend to be the ones who are more likely to get adverse health effects from mould exposures. They're the ones who smell the chemicals or walk past David Jones' perfume department and get a migraine headache. Yeah. You know? So um, the smell is that damp, musty odour smell, and that is indicative that it's growing somewhere in the house. And if you can't see the visible mould, that's worse because you know it's probably hidden. And that's when it's like having a possum, a dead possum in the roof. Exactly right. Like you know it's there, but you don't know where it is. But you can smell this awful smell. Mm. So, what do we do? Okay, so let's. Uh, we can get into more detail about what to do at that point, but why don't we take a step back for a, and what happens if you flood your laundry or the kids throw up in the middle of the night and they get it all over the carpet? Like what can we do to stop mould from growing in the first place or well, from I, eating all that yeah, goodness? Yeah. Well, the first thing, if you have a water event, you want to dry it within 24 hours. That's so important. You do that and it's not a mould problem. Mm. It's just a water damage issue. The problem is if you have a storm event and the insurance company or or the uh, water damage restoration consultant can't get there on time, you have to dry it out. You've got maximum of 48 hours before the microbes sitting on that surface are going to start proliferating. Which are there naturally. Which are there naturally. Got you, yeah. But if you had a water event previously, you've gone into this house, you've rented or bought it, you don't know the history. So there have been previous water damage events and that can create high levels of fungi, fungal particulate, i.e. spores and hyphae sits on the surface, but it's not a problem. You have a water event, it can activate that fungi and hyphae high levels that are sitting there. All of a sudden, once fungi has moisture, it starts producing all these spores and hyphae and it can activate other events and then create high levels of fungal particulate and that's the worst case scenario you can't see it as visible mold but when we do tape samples or air samples it comes up really high in aspergillus penicillium etc which produce mycotoxins and cause serious adverse health effects are porous surfaces more prone to mold than say a slate floor like is your cushion or your leather is that a real thing or is that just something i've Assumed no, from that's, growing up. that's true because <laughs> okay. it's cellulose based. Now, if it's cellulose based, it has carbon in it. Um, plasterboard is far more likely to enable microbial growth to grow. Masonry and um, tiles and rocks, etc., are inorganic materials, and mold doesn't grow on that. The key, however, is that if it's dirty and there's any dirt on it or debris, that organic the soil and the food dust and all that stuff or high levels of dust mite etc that's going to be the food for the mold so when you see mold growing in a split system it's not growing on the plastic because it won't grow on plastic but it when it's dirty the dirt will be the food for the fungi sitting on it and that's why decluttering and keeping your house clean and free from visible dust is so critical oh i love that go more into that talk to us because we We go into homes and a lot of our listeners will think, yeah, but I have a house that's dusty. How does that affect my mould? But clearly decluttering does have a flow-on effect to your health because you can clean better and you can keep an eye and notice. (laughs) And look, what clutter does is that it stops air movement. And if you stop air movement and you get all this water vapour, every person in the house contributes 10 litres of water vapour i.e. water in the air of in the gas gaseous no phase way. per day every day yeah that's so that's huge it is and that includes your bathing it's approximate figure bathing uh cooking laundering wow. all that stuff so if you've got like eight people in a two-bedroom apartment that it wasn't designed for that you're breathing out 20 mils of water vapor every every breath um and of course that's about three liters of water vapor 
just on breathing out every day. So if you have too many people in an environment that it's not designed for, you've got all this water vapour in the air. The problem with the new builds now with this eight-star energy rated or six-star energy rated homes is when that water vapour hits the gyprock or the walls or the building envelope, we'd say, either the roof, floor or walls, and it hits an impermeable wrap or a vapour barrier, it hits dew point, gets cold, condenses. So now you've got all this moisture in the hidden in the wall. And if that's there for 48 hours, because remember it's 48 hours you've got, all the microbes in the surface of that are going to start germinating. And that's the problem. We've built homes that are energy efficient and it's correlating with far worse health outcomes. We need permeable wraps in the walls to enable water vapour to move through the wall um, in order to deal with this water vapour, otherwise it's a problem. Now, the research from the University of Tasmania by Dr Tim Law, who's an architectural scientist, showed that 40% of new builds in temperate climates like Melbourne Tassie had condensation issues by their first winter. Wow. That's not long. We're talking a disaster on such a massive scale that many of the new apartments, especially in Sydney, it's a housing crisis. The building defects that are going on in their first year, the waterproof membranes are failing. We've gone 20 years ago, several events happened that dramatically escalated our exposure to mould. The first of those was um, introducing waterproof membranes that are liquid-based so you can paint your waterproof membranes. That's a disaster. Have they not always been that way? No, it was always sheet-based waterproof membranes, PVC sheet-based. Yeah, and you'd lay it. Yes. Gotcha. They last 25 to 35 years. Now, the liquid-based membranes last seven. But the bathrooms last a lot longer than that. (laughs) Yeah, and money (laughs) isn't... As I'm not really my bathroom that often. Yeah, and money isn't as liquid as f- for seven years. Well, can you imagine doing a bathroom in every seven years because your no. waterproof membranes have failed? No. And if anyone uses essential oils in that bathroom, like eucalyptus or clove or anything like that, and that gets through the grout, you will compromise the elongation or what we call the elasticity of the waterproof membrane. Waterproof membranes are petrochemicals. When you add solvents, and essential oils are very good solvents, that's why I use eucalyptus for stickiness, etc. Disaster for cleaning. And there's so much misinformation about that. You don't use essential oils in the shower because if it gets into the grout, it will potentially dissolve the waterproof membrane. Mm. I hate clove oil for that. I think clove oil is amazing for as a tooth pain. Yes, my Because <laughs> it deadens used to give the nerves. It to <laughs> it's in very toxic, you know. But it's a really good um, solvent. So I've always heard and I've found online in the past that if you do have mould, you do this dissolve um, clove oil in with water, spray it on it. I'm assuming that's... Look, clove oil is a very good fungicide, uh-huh. anti-fungicide. Right. There's no doubt about it. But most essential oils have fungicidal properties. Why? Because the plant can't move. It can't run away from the fungi sitting on it. So it produces chemicals like essential oil vapours to get rid of the fungi. Most fungi have some fungicidal properties and clove has an amazing fungicidal property. The problem is that the toxic dose is very close to the therapeutic dose. Right. It's a very strong essential oil and it stains. So when you're spraying it on gyprock or wallboard, it can stain it. Mm. So that's already a problem. Yeah. The problem is when you're spraying it, it's actually quite toxic to inhale mm-hmm. because it's very such a strong oil it that it shouldn't be near children and any pregnant woman, etc. Um, and I think when it comes to cleaning, because my husband and I manufacture our own cleaning products and sold our house to do this, cleaning, you need to emulsify fats, so you need a detergent. Essential oils aren't detergents, they're just antiseptics. So they don't actually, when it comes to cleaning and preventing mould, you'll need to reduce the dirt, but you need to actually emulsify any of the organic matter, like the dirt and the debris that's on there and the sweat and, you know, the soap scum that comes from your body in the showers etc you need a little bit of detergent for that in a bucket of hot water with a good microfiber cloth it's the microfiber cloth that's physically removing it that does most of the work you look stunned. Uh, yeah, we are. This I is am. what we were like yesterday. This is we why we stunned. wanted you to come in, Nicole. Because <laughs> we're like, if we don't know this stuff, there's probably tens of thousands of our listeners who also need to know this stuff. And what a great platform to get like a 30-minute, 40-minute, like this is the high level. Don't freak out. You don't need to go and sell your houses like today. But this is what we can, we can learn these things. 
I, I'm, I'm, there's so much for you and I to talk about about my house, <laughs> but we won't do that now. And my house. I've got a new build. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we just wanted to take a few seconds to say thank you so much for tuning in. We really appreciate this podcast community. And on that note, we wanted to get to know you better. Podcasting is a unique platform where you get to know a whole lot about us. We don't really have an easy way of getting to know all of you. So we wanted to know what resonates with you in our podcast. What do you like? What don't you like? So we're offering you a $100 gift voucher for any of our products and services in order to get that feedback. We're running a listener survey right now and we just wanted you to tell us a little bit more about you. It seriously takes just a couple of minutes. And as we said, you go into the draw to win a $100 gift certificate. Get on it! So head on over to artofdecluttering.com.au slash survey or click on the link in the show notes. We can't wait to get to know you. We want to create content that serves you and meets you where you're at. So give us a few minutes of your life, hop on over and take the survey. Again, visit outofdecluttering.com.au slash survey or visit the link in the show. Why is the University of New England the only Australian public university awarded the maximum five stars for overall experience 14 years in a row? Well, they understand their students aren't all kids. They get that you're working, have a career, maybe a family, and definitely don't live on noodles. The University of New England lets you study online with choice from more than 170 courses and 24-7 online support. Apply now to start March 2nd. Check une.edu.au. Hmm, I feel like noodles now. Thanks, and let's get back to the show. So, um... I, I do want to give our listeners some tips, uh, you know, we don't want them to, you know, set their house on fire <laughs> because they're so scared to walk into it or so scared about anything. Like we, we don't want to induce fear in people. So um, what can what tips can we give um, that people can reduce any fear that they may have around their house but be um, what is it? Yeah, well, it be, might be aware. Be, that's right. Yeah. There's actually, there might be reason for concern and what can we do about it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I'm concerned for my own home because I'm in a 70-year-old home and I've got lots of the symptoms. So I'm, I'm like, I want the information so that I can do something about it because once you have the knowledge, you have the responsibility. Yes. Yes, that's exactly right. So first is to understand that um, microbes proliferate when they have moisture. So keep your house dry. A healthy home is a dry home. Mm. So you want to, just even if you get a cheap hygrometer from JK or electronic store, and just try and keep your humidity levels between 40 and 60% is a good start. If you live in a high humid area, you need a dehumidifier with a thermostat to keep it between 40 and 60%, and that would prevent pretty much most of the mold related okay. issues in melbourne where it's really dry we get 35 percent relative humidity it's often a water event or a drainage issue or a roof leak or clogged gutters i mean welcome to every house yes. every house needs a significant housekeeping you can't be in a healthy home unless you're maintaining a healthy home mm. and it takes effort so you need to make sure that the water can't penetrate into the building envelope that you do a site inspection uh, a big question I ask all my clients is, is there any pest activity? Are there any termites that you're aware of? Because wherever the termites are, that's where the moisture is. Right. So termite, those two things correlate. Absolutely. Right. That's really Cockroaches, interesting. ants, I always ask about pest activity. Yeah. And other things like, how? what is the maximum number of kids in a slumber party would you have in that bedroom for? <laughs> because I can see visible mould in patches so obviously there's enough water vapor that's supporting microbial activity but it might be dry when I'm moisture mapping on that day so often I find a lot of parents use humidifiers which generate huge amounts of steam and then try, trying to help their child with dry cough but what now what they've done is create a massive microbial issue and mold because the fungi and bacteria are already sitting on the surfaces and if you have sustained humidity for 48 hours, mm. the microbes are going to take off. And then the kids are going to keep coughing kids because they're breathing sick. in the mould. That's and right. 
So if they were to put a humidifier on and then open up the house or have a dehumidifier, like can you offset some of that stuff or is it just best to avoid, like, you know, dryers, how they extract all the moisture out of your clothes, you know, and we always grow up with you've got to open the laundry window whenever you put. Is that enough? In Melbourne that's enough because we're very dry here. Mm. You know, we've got humidity between 32% and 70%. Mm. In Sydney, different kettle of fish. You open the window, you've got humidity coming into the house if you've got the D, the air conditioning on because it's such a massive continent with seven cli- eight climate zones plus many different microclimate zones every house is unique mm. so you've got to think about where's the moisture moisture goes from high to low so if there's more outside because you live in a human environment it's going to be driven in when you open the window in melbourne where it's dry open windows where you've got the humidity from the bathing and the hot showers etc so yeah you can open the window and then it will move it out out right so you need to understand how it moves and that's why look just a 20 dollar hygrometer that gives you temperature and humidity is a good way to start getting your head around the whole humidity thing because when humidity is raised at 60 percent and high all the dust mite in the dust of the house is going to proliferate now dust mite is the most common allergy in the world and affects 21 percent of the world's population it is in fact the most common allergy that people suffer from that's why you want to reduce the dust and the clutter as much as possible and as i said yesterday at the conference um when it comes to dust what's in dust it's your house dust mite it's your fungi it's your bacteria it's your lead dust it's potentially asbestos fibers it's your solvents it's your dry cleaning solvents it's your air fresheners and your perfumes and the pesticides you track through your feet i mean it's the archaeological dig site of your entire house Every hour you shed between 14 and 37 million bacterial genome copies in the air. <laughs> That's frightening. You, and gross. Are, you and gross. Can... Yeah, I'm not breathing anybody else's <laughs> air anymore. <laughs> In that's fact, what... let's go out and record this podcast outside, please. <laughs> We've got no carpet here, that's good. And he vacuumed for us as well. <laughs> but that's the thing. Every, you, forensics is forever changed now mm. because we can do PCR, DNA testing of the dust. But everyone that's ever walked in your house, every pet, every plant, you can DNA sample on the carpet. That's why I say with people with allergies, get rid of the carpet. Mm-hmm. Every year, a six-carpeted room house will accumulate 18 kilos of dust that will never come out. 18 kilos of dust in the carpet 18 kilos. for a six-carpeted room house, yes. So that's why when you go into those old terrace homes, you know, built in the 1880s that yeah, have like 40, anywhere. 50 years of carpets that have been sitting there, you go in, it smells dusty, but it's clean. The surfaces are clean. But it smells dusty because it's holding hundreds of kilos of dust. And every time you walk on it, they become airborne. So what's interesting is when we moved into our house, which, as I said, is about 70 years old, we pulled all the carpet out, um, pulled all the soft furnishings out because my kids are asthmatic. So we went, we're not going to risk it, pulled it all out and redid it. We spoke to the Asthma Foundation and said, what's your advice? What should we do? Do we go floorboards? Do we go carpet? And they recommended a particular type of carpet. What they didn't say is... It'll be 18 kilos heavier in six years. Yes. So. 18 is, times six. Yeah. I well, for the whole, I'm thinking like one room. Okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> do it, like is my vacuum cleaner going to, like is a good vacuum cleaner going to get more of that out? Yes. Is there a, yeah, what do we do? So the va- in my book, there's only really two things I recommend people buy. Most of it's knowledge. Mm-hmm. It's all in the book. How to reduce your allergen load, how to address mould. The key thing that I strongly suggest they invest is a good vacuum cleaner. Mm. And the vacuum cleaner needs a HEPA filter. So it's like a pleated white filter. Yes, I have one of those. Very important because it'll filter below 0.3 microns, microns. So your hair, one hair on your head is worth is um, has a diameter of about 70 microns. Most of your allergens between 2 and 20. Wow. Dust mite, dust mite feces, mold spores, pollen, pet dander, all of those things. So... The vacuum cleaner is critical. The first thing I say to clients is, do you get an external um, commercial cleaner coming to clean your house? Are they using your vacuum cleaner or are they using theirs? Because the last thing I want is you, them spreading um, contaminants from one water damage time to the other when they clean your house, which can af- affect our lab results when we're doing air testing going, this is weird. Oh, you just vacuumed and it wasn't your vacuum cleaner, it was the cleaners and now it's causing all these different types of fungi in that space. 
Do not allow commercial cleaners to use their vacuum cleaners. Always have one dedicated to your home. It needs to have a bag. It needs to have a HEPA filter. And it needs to have ideally a motorised head to dig into the pile. So that every time you use a vacuum like that, you're actually purifying the air. Because the air coming out is cleaner than the air going in. Right. If you don't have that HEPA filter, what essentially you're doing is pulling all of those things I just said is in your carpet to become airborne and now it's taking days to, to fall and it's exacerbating people with allergies mm. and asthma. That's really, that's such a simple thing because I know that at, when we got new cleaners, they I said to them, do you have a preference on vacuum cleaners? Because I hadn't updated ours for about 15 years. And Teresa said to me, I want you to go get this vacuum and it has this HEPA filter thing and this is this is what I want you to do. It was $350. It wasn't like a $1,200 vacuum. Like it was really reasonable and that's there for them to use. And I feel like, Teresa, thank you. <laughs> because that's not a hard thing to do. A $20 moisture thing is not a hard thing to do. I'm excited by the steps that we can take in the broader community to actually becoming aware and doing something about it. Yeah, I'm sitting here like you're not hearing from me because my mind is blown and I'm trying to pull it back into my head. <laughs> <laughs> So, Nicole, you have written a book, you have got so much information on your website and people can do courses. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Where where can people find out more about you? We have a book that we're going to give away over social media this week. So look out for that, people. As you're listening and as you're watching us on social media, make sure you get in the draw for Nicole's amazing book. For everybody else, you need to buy her book. So We bought a copy it. yesterday because we were so excited. <laughs> The book's Healthy Home, Healthy Family. It's currently in the third edition, so that was published last year. And I'm obviously going to create an audio book now that you lovely yes. ladies told me where I can get – I'm in a recording studio. Exactly. I'm very excited about <laughs> it's that. going to get done. <laughs> Um, And it really is a a culmination of 20 years of research looking at how our homes affect human health. So there's chapters on allergens and mould, there's chapters on electromagnetic fields and its impact on human health, chapters on drinking water. Why? My motto is if you don't get a filter, your body is going to become the filter. So that's why a water filter is critical, Uh, the right vacuum cleaner is important. So were those those two things? The vacuum cleaner and the water filter. Yes, they're, they're certainly the most important. And microfiber cloths to clean the house. Reduce your toxic load. You don't need these toxic chemicals. There's no place for antibacterials in a healthy home. We know that the more diverse the bacteria is in the household dust, the lower the risk for asthma and allergies. So everything people have been told through the TV and these channels are, is actually false based on the scientific literature. You need to go back to trying to air your house with fresh air, providing you're not living near you know, a 10-lane highway or near agriculture and farming where they're spraying. <laughs> You've got to use... Part of my PhD was looking at the exposure zones. How far do you need to be from a high-voltage transmission line, from a mobile phone base station, from coal seam gas exploration, from a busy road to reduce your risk for different types of health effects. So the book really goes into that. It was written for the lay person, but it's packed full of evidence because I'm a real stickler for that. I do like your evidence-based stuff. Like it's not woo-woo. There's no mm-hmm. woo-woo about you. <laughs> no, and that's because I'm, I'm married to a very critical husband who just said, that's BS. Where's the evidence for that? So you won't asked... watch me, honey. <laughs> I'll find it. <laughs> So it really held me in good stead. So I speak a lot at com- medical conferences, both in Australia and overseas, and I'm probably often the non-PhD, um, non-professor, but I'm just, I just give you the facts based on my research, and obviously I'm nearly finished the PhD now. But, yeah, it's really um, important because it's 90% of our time is, is inside the built environment. So that's the book Healthy Home, Healthy Family. I have a lot of data and, and videos on my website, buildingbiology.com.au. Lots of videos. I've done a lot of stuff with media on, you know, chemicals in cosmetics and sunscreens. And it's good to see it's finally come out after I've been speaking about it for 10 years. <laughs> you're, you're playing the long game, the girl. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and just... My real focus is helping consumers make an informed choice because, unfortunately, people don't understand most of what you buy in a supermarket shelf in a hardware store has never been tested Mm -hmm. for its impact on human health. 
you know, there's 145 million chemicals registered for use on the world's largest database, the Chemical Abstract Service. Every 60 seconds, another 20 chemicals are registered. That's 200,000 every week. 90% of them have never been tested yeah. because we live in a society where the burden of proof isn't on manufacturers to prove safety. And this is just nuts. Yes. As a mother going, have they actually tested wireless technology and radio frequencies on children's health? No. We, our children are the guinea pigs from the, cr- from the cradle to the grave. We don't know what impact this RF is going to have on human health because no one had the telecommunications weren't required to prove it was safe. And yet it was used as a military tool. You know, 5G was used as a military weapon for crowd control. I mean, I'm not even going to start there, yeah. but let's, we're, we're yeah. almost out of time. <laughs> we, we might get I you think, back on to yeah. talk more about it. And I think, you know, if people go to your website, then that's a great way to stay connected. And we were even flicking through your book last night. We didn't get into it really late, but we're like, oh, we've got 15 minutes. Like, flick through it. We're like, oh, there's so much goodness to read. So thank you, Nicole. You're I welcome. wish we could talk for hours, but um, Kirsty needs to get on a flight in an hour. Ooh, so <laughs> quick. So uh, we're just going to read a really, really quick review from Apple Podcast. It is by Troubled Clef, um, and it's a five-star review, and it just happens to be on makeup. <laughs> <laughs> so I just decluttered my makeup, including including hairbrushes, clips, etc., while listening to the podcast. I'm glad I discovered these podcasts. I select them by what I want to declutter next. So thank you, Troubled Clef, all the way from the USA. We really appreciate your reviews. Um, as we said, we're going to be giving away Nicole's book on social media and we'll figure that out when we get to it. <laughs> Um, So keep an eye on our Facebook page and come over to our Facebook community, the Art of Decluttering community, where you can um, have more detailed conversations around mould and around a healthy, happy home. And um, we would love to hear what you thought about this amazing interview by our standards with Nicole. (laughs) So thank you, Nicole. Thank Thank you you so so much. much for having me. You're welcome. See you all next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks for joining us. If you've learnt something awesome today, we'd love you to leave us a review on iTunes or Facebook so others can find our podcast too. Don't forget you can see the show notes in your podcast app or over at our website, artofdecluttering.com.au. So if there's anything you want more info on, check it out there. If you'd like to join our supporter community, you can do so over at patreon.com slash theartofdecluttering. We hope you have a great rest of your day and enjoy the freedom. Captain, yep. we have a crying passenger in 23B. Copy that. How old is this one? 45 to 50-ish. Well, four hours of a toddler kicking your seat is enough to break anyone. What should we do? Hang on. You're... Wait a sec. You're breaking up. Kids will be kids, but there'll be better kids on board Emirates with up to 100 games to keep them busy and make time fly. Search Emirates Department of Family Travel. Your first stop for flying family.